the 15 minute or less lecture series, Human Anatomy, chapter 19, the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is broken down into two divisions, the parasympathetic division and the sympathetic division. Both of these divisions innervate the exact same structures, but they have what are usually opposite uh, responses for those structures. For instance, the parasympathetic division leads to an inhibition of the heart's beating, a slowing down of the heart's rate of beating, while the sympathetic division will accelerate the rate the heart is beating. So again, there are four nerve networks in the body, the somatic uh, nervous system, which is of sensations that we are consciously aware of in most cases, including special senses of vision, taste, touch, etc. And that allows us to have voluntary control of the skeletal muscles. The autonomic nervous uh, system is, includes many sensory receptors that collect information that we are not aware of. They send those to the central nervous system, which then leads to the autonomic motor neurons involuntarily, often unconsciously controlling structures such as smooth muscle tissue, cardiac muscles, and glands. Finally, we have the enteric nervous system, which is just for the gastrointestinal tract does not necessarily need to communicate with the central nervous system, although it does communicate with it and get influenced by it through the autonomic nervous system. So here it is, brain of your gut, a specialized network of nerves and ganglia in the gastrointestinal tract, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. There are two large plexuses within the gastrointestinal tract, the myenteric plexus and the submucosal plexus. And of course, it does communicate with the central nervous system. So, sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. In both cases, they start with uh, receiving information from autonomic sensory receptors. These are uh, interoreceptors, receptors within the body. Uh, these can include chemoreceptors that are perhaps monitoring the composition of the blood. They can be mechanoreceptors, for instance, uh, measuring how stretched internal organs are, such as the urinary bladder or the stomach. And they also can cause a sensation we are very aware of, which is pain. So we can receive painful visceral sensations. Uh, these then pass the information on to the autonomic sensory neurons. Uh, often the autonomic sensory neurons are also the autonomic sensory receptors. And they also, it's worth noting that somatic senses can also influence the autonomic nervous system, although we're not going to go into that in detail. So the information, the sensory information arrives into the brain and it goes to the primary autonomic control centers. This includes the control centers within the hypothalamus that help regulate things like the water balance, the amount of volume necessary for the blood, aka may make us, for instance, get thirsty, so it will drink more water to increase the overall uh, volume of the blood. It also includes regulating our body temperature, regulating hunger, regulating various elements of the homeostasis of maintaining a stable environment in our body. In the pons, we have the pontine receptor group. It is important for helping us to control breathing, especially limiting how deep we breathe so we don't damage our uh, respiratory tissues. And then the medulla oblongata. It has a variety of centers, including the cardiovascular center. This helps to control the rate and force of the heartbeat, as well as the diameter of blood vessels and the medullary respiratory center, which basically controls the basic rhythm of breathing. From here, well, we of course will be sending out commands via the autonomic motor neurons to the autonomic effectors. And these effectors can include smooth muscle tissues and organs, as well as glands and cardiac muscle tissue. Uh, autonomic motor pathway always consists of two motor neurons. So you have one motor neuron that is originating in the lateral gray horn and sending its signal, its axon out into the per peripheral nervous system. It'll end up entering a ganglion, an autonomic ganglion, where it will synapse with the postganglion neuron, which will then carry the signal to the target effector. So you always will have two motor neurons in a series uh, synapsing in a autonomic ganglion. Uh, so that means that we have uh, innervation, dual innervation of all of the various visceral structures, one coming from the sympathetic division, one coming from the parasympathetic division, both divisions having two motor neurons in a row synapsing in a ganglion before reaching the target structure.
Uh, there are two uh, big types of autonomic nervous system motor neurons. They're the cholinergic neurons. These are the ones that release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Turns out all preganglionic neurons are cholinergic, as well as all parasympathetic postganglionic neurons. So the parasympathetic division, all cholinergic neurons. And also the sympathetic postganglionic neurons specifically for sweat glands. For sweat glands, they are also cholinergic. Then there's the adrenergic uh, neurons. These are the ones that release the neurotransmitter norepinephrine, more commonly known as adrenaline. This includes most of the sympathetic postganglionic neurons. So most of them are adrenergic. And then when they release uh, norepinephrine, it will bind to adrenergic receptors on the effector. This can either stimulate or inhibit the functions of that target effector. Also, the release of norepinephrine into the bloodstream by the adrenal medulla can stimulate these receptors. So, the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions do not send out their neurons in a straight line. Often, it has to pass through various structures, including various plexuses around the body, as well as going into the ganglion. So we have a certain name, plexuses, cardiac plexus around the heart, pulmonary plexus near the lungs, esophageal plexus around the uh, esophagus, hypogastric plexus toward the uh, inferior portion of our um, trunk of the body. And then we have some plexuses that run along major arteries, including the celiac plexus, the superior mesenteric plexus, the renal plexus, and the inferior mesenteric plexus. Uh, sympathetic division, also known as the thoracolumbar division, because the nerves, the motor nerves coming from the thoracic lumbar region of the spinal cord are the ones that um, this sympathetic division uses. Um, again, a signal will come from the brain down to the relevant region of the spinal cord. It will then synapse in the lateral horn with the preganglionic neuron. It will then send the command out to the anterior root. This uh, nerve fiber will then enter what's known as the sympathetic trunk ganglia. This is a vertical row of ganglia that lie next to the vertebral column on the right as well as on the left. They are going to receive all of the preganglionic axons, all of those fibers from the thoracolumbar division. The preganglionic axons can either do one of three things. They can enter and synapse in the first ganglionic uh, ganglion they arrive at, or they can go up or down the sympathetic trunk ganglion structure and then synapse at a higher or lower ganglion, or they can pass completely through the structure without synapsing and then eventually synapse in a uh, separate ganglion, uh, often referred to as preverbal ganglia. They're often associated with various plexuses. The post uh, ganglionic Axons can then either return to the uh, spinal nerve via the gray communicating rami to innervate various blood vessels or sweat glands or the pili muscles of the body walls, or they can go up uh, through the upper trunk ganglion and join to nerves going to the heart and travel to the head, shoulder, and neck regions, or they can go down into the middle and lower trunk ganglia, join in various plexuses, and then innervate structures in the trunk of body, in the abdomen and pelvic regions. And these structures are often referred to as splanchnic nerves because, again, uh, they are forming in these specialized areas in the abdomen and pelvic region. Uh, the preverbal ganglia uh, are forming splanchnic nerves that have left the sympathetic trunk ganglia without synapsing. Uh, they will then uh, synapse in these specific ganglia, these preverbal ganglia. With to lead, pass the signal on to the postganglionic neurons. There are four main preverbal ganglia. You have the celiac ganglion in the celiac plexus, the superior mesenteric ganglion in the superior mesenteric plexus, the inferior mesenteric ganglion in the inferior mesenteric plexus, and the aorticorenal ganglion. And again, these uh, postganglionic neurons that leave these ganglia will then innervate these very structures in that general area. So, postganglionic neurons are myelinate, unmyelinated. So, this is the rare exception where neurons are not myelinated. Postganglionic neurons are unmyelinated, no myelination. They target effectors and cause the fight or flight response. And these effects are normally localized, except when the adrenal medulla releases norepinephrine, that then stimulates all these effectors to respond. An example of a uh, 
fight or flight uh, response includes breathing faster, uh, suppressing the GI tract, and increasing blood flow to skeletal muscles. Showing the heart rate is not one of them. Parasympathetic division, also known as the craniosacral division, because it is sending off signals from the uh, brain itself via the cranial nerves or from the uh, sacral region of the spinal cord. There are no rows of ganglia. Instead, the ganglia tend to be very close to the effector. So the cranial sacral division, also known as the parasympathetic division. In the cranial outflow, you are getting signals sent out through the cranial nerves 3, 7, uh, 9, to enter one of four uh, terminal ganglia or via cranial nerve 10 vagus to innervate structures in the thoracic and abdominal cavities. Um, and then we have the sacral flow coming out. These are forming pelvic splanchic nerves that will then lead to the walls of the target structures to um, enter a ganglion, a terminal ganglion that then connects with the postganglionic neuron. The terminal ganglia in the head include the ciliary ganglion, which innervates the smooth muscle fibers of the eye, the perigopalatine ganglion, which innervates the basal mucosa, palate, pharynx, and lacrimal glands, the submandibular ganglion, that innervates the submandibular and sublingual glands, and the optic ganglia, which innervates the parotid gland. Uh, they also have unmyelinated postganglionic neurons. So postganglionic neurons are unmyelinated, and their effect on their effectors is what's known as the rest and digest response sometimes also known as the breed and feed response. And they don't have any overwhelming triggers, so normally they're only working in balance with the sympathetic division. And examples of their effects include constricting the pupil, relaxing the rectum, and increasing salivation. However, they do not tend to stimulate the liver to release glucose. That is a sympathetic effect. So we have two uh, systems innervating our various visceral structures, the parasympathetic division and the sympathetic division. They have sort of opposing um, effects on these structures, but they are always working in balance with each other. The only exception is when we get an overwhelming response because of adrenaline, aka norepinephrine, being released. So the simplest visceral reflex arc. You have the receptor, that detects the signal. The sensory neuron is going to carry it to the central nervous system. Note sometimes the receptor is the sensory neuron. This will then uh, synapse with uh, various interneurons so that the information can be integrated and processed. And then the command will be sent out down the uh, spinal cord or brain to the preganglionic motor neuron, which will then send the signal to a postganglionic motor neuron, which will then cause an effect on the visceral effector. So you need at least uh, six, probably more. Uh, so the simplest would be six um, various structures in the simple visceral reflex arc.